and here we are again, mm -hmm. uh, just roughly six months later. And in your first interview, you said that your Michaelmas term teaching for the Good Heart Chair had consisted of two courses, one in jurisprudence and the other in legal and political philosophy. And I wonder if you felt pleased with the feedback that you received from students and so on. Yes, indeed. I think those, those lecture courses went very well from my point of view. Um, students seemed very engaged, um, um, and I was in, engaged and encouraged by them yes. um, very much. And um, I have had opportunity to interact with a number of the students over the next several months. Um, not each of them by any means, but um, a goodly number of them. Um, and um, even in a, one or two cases, um, students I had in the course helped me with my own research. Um, in one case in particular, a, a very important piece of um, translating from Spanish and from Latin into English I needed, and a student was able to, a student from Venezuela was able to help me. Um, and other students I've kept in contact with, they've written papers for me. Um, um, I did a lot of, I read, oh, I don't know, 20, 25 um, essays that were um, sent to me um, over at, at the end of the term, um, and I was able to read them, comment on them, interact with students about them and all the like. So all that was very good. Um, I think um, I got a lot out of it personally, and I think that I was able to offer them something as well. So did you do any different courses in the length term? Or no, I didn't. Same? Yeah. No, I didn't do any more um, or different. Um, my primary responsibilities were in Michaelmas term, um, and then um, of course marking uh, exams at the end, um, but nothing in between except in these informal yes. contacts with students. Yes, and then of course your research projects, and you said in your interview that there were two or three of these, and the first was, and I quote from your interview, articulating a view about the nature and underlying foundations of the idea of the rule of law, mm -hmm. and you said this would be enunciated in the forthcoming Boutwood lecture at Corpus Christi College. I wonder if you could just elaborate the ideas that you presented there. Right. Um, <clears throat> the invitation to offer the Boutwood lecture um, gave me an occasion f to um, think m more extensively about a project um, that I had begun before that, um, thinking about foundations of the idea of rule of law, moral and social foundations of the rule of law. Um, and I combined some ideas that I had already, already developed in preliminary papers which have since been published, um, working on what I, the core idea I call the idea of fidelity to law. Um, I incorporated that, um, plus some material that I had come to see um, as especially important from my work in the manuscripts of Sir Matthew Hale in the 17th century, and lectures on it in the Michaelmas term. Um, and then some other work on um, I had done some years ago on um, the role of um, public reasoning in um, law and political matters generally. Um, so I combined those three kind of ideas. The core idea for the whole project on the rule of law is this concept of fidelity. And the main argument is that <clears throat> when we speak of the rule of law, um, we should distinguish between what I call the rule by law and law's rule. Um, ruling by law is um, um, a, f a phenomenon, a way of governing such that um, those who hold power use law as an instrument of the exercise of their power. Whereas the rule of law, or as I call it, law's rule, is um, has the aim of subjecting the exercise of power itself to law. Um, law is to rule, not human beings or institutions. Um, so um, the question then arises, what 
could it be for law, not human beings, but law to rule? After all, law rules only if human beings um, act in accord with it in some way. So um, I spent the, the Boutwood lecture especially thinking about and articulating three ways in which we might say law genuinely rules. And the one, the first idea is that this idea of fidelity, which is the core idea for the whole project. Um, and by fidelity, I mean um, um, a broad, community-wide responsibility um, held um, by um, citizens, um, ordinary people, and by officials um, mutually and reciprocally to hold each other accountable to the law. Um, the law, in this way, itself, as it were, doesn't rule, but those who are ruled by it hold each other accountable under that law. And a large part of my argument is that um, we have always thought of the rule of law as somehow an exercise, a way of exercising power, but in this way I'm, I'm arguing that there is um, a prior kind of moral commitment on the part of all of us to hold each other accountable um, to that law which we regard as, we regard as governing our interactions and activities, both official and um, sort of lay and ordinary. Um, so that was the first core. What is it for law to rule? It is for there to be a robust, I call it ethos or culture, of fidelity, of um, taking responsibility for holding each other accountable to the law. That's one way. Um, the second way um, was suggested by some ideas of Sir Matthew Hale, fairly complicated ones, and they really have to do with um, his views of English, if you will, constitutional law. But the main idea, um, um, introduced by a very strange um, Latin tag uh, la uh, label, um, he calls it the potestas irentans, that's the, the Latin for it, that is the 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 invalidating power of law. Um, and his idea here is that um, the activities of especially those in power, those in ruling power, um, are governed by law in such a way as for, for some, for many of their activities, um, law will empower those, give legal status to those actions. But if they are performed not meeting the conditions of that legal status or authorization. They are, those actions are um, deprived of their legal status. And being deprived of their legal status, those who <clears throat> um, try to exercise power under the color of law, but without having this warrant from law, um, they stand, as it were, legally naked, unprotected by these legal powers. And so there's a sense in which law, Hale suggests, a sense in which law both provides the, the resources for exercising power, but in the very providing of those resources, provides means of controlling the exercise of it. So that's the second kind of idea. Um, the third um, has to do with public reasoning. Um, that's a bit more complicated um, idea, but the, the main here, thought here is that um, for law to rule is for... Um, there to be a very um, robust framework and discipline of um, arguing, providing arguments and reasons um, with respect to the requirements of law. A framework for argument and reason, reasoning that is open not only to um, the ruling elite, but is, is uh, but more as broadly as possible open to um, all participants. Um, in the legal system. Um, so I articulate this very briefly put, but I articulate three ways in which we might want to say law rules. It's there's a robust um, ethos of fidelity. There is um, a kind of capability of law to um, give status, but also withhold legal status from actions of those who are exercising power. And there is in place um, a framework for um, public assessment and public um, reasoning and argument about the claims that law makes and demands on us. Um, 
There may be more to this idea, um, but those are the three ideas that I articulated in the Boutwood lecture. Um, and it's really the core of the larger project now of working out this notion of the rule of law. Thank you. Um, you your main research project was based on the contract that you have with OUP <coughs> to produce a collection of works by Sir Matthew Hale, whom you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And this was based on an unpublished manuscript in the British Library and another only obscurely published essay mm -hmm. in critique of the important philosopher Thomas Hobbes. Mm -hmm. um, could you share with us, Professor Postina, any discoveries or progress that you've made in this project? Yes. Well, um, because I um, was very keen to develop ideas I had begun thinking about in the of law, develop them for the Baldwin lecture, um, I spent a great deal of time working in the background on that project. Um, and then subsequent to that, um, lecturing around in various places, Athens, um, London, um, Krakow, Poland, and elsewhere, <clears throat> on that idea. Um, and as a result, much more of my time was put into the rule of law project than the Hale editing project. Um, nevertheless, the key, that key second point I mentioned um, a few minutes ago, about Hale on the invalidating, or as he calls it, the irritating power of law. <clears throat> that came from a rather extensive piece of work I did, trying to get clear um, on some of the philosophical and legal historical background <clears throat> of um, the main themes and theses that um, Hale was um, articulating in those two unpublished manuscripts, especially um, the manuscript in critique of Hobbes. Um, <clears throat> so I spent a great deal of time working on um, trying to locate the source of Hale's um, idea of the invalidating power of law. It is in one respect um, a fairly familiar idea to legal philosophers um, and to constitutional um, theorists. On the other hand, the particular way he used it and the, um, the odd Latin tag he gave, gave for it um, was puzzling to me. Um, and um, so I worked back and back and back, and I actually found some very interesting um, resources in um, medieval canon law and even some earlier resources in Roman law. Um, which he may well have been um, drawing on, not directly, I suspect, but through the work of um, the early 17th century um, Spanish legal philosopher called Francisco, Francisco Suarez. Um, so i working from Hale back to Suarez, to through Suarez to some of these canon law um, sources. Um, I did now, I do now have a much um, richer understanding of at least that part of his work. Um, just a few weeks ago, to end the paragraph, just a few weeks ago, um, I started back on the editing project in general. And um, so now I'm, I'm sort of doing the somewhat more um, mundane work um, of um, um, getting the manuscript put in shape. So, <clears throat> Professor Pasadena, what strikes me is the materials that you found very useful. Were these materials that you might, you may also have found in back, back home in Carolina, <coughs> or did you find that there was more material available to you here? The resources here, not so much the library resources, uh, although that too, but the intellectual resources, the resources of my faculty colleagues in particular, um, and um, a couple of... Uh, knowledgeable um, PhD students. They were invaluable in, for my work on this particular aspect of Hale's work, the connection between Hale and Suarez and the like. Um, in fact, it was a very important uh, kind of thing for me. Um, the <clears throat> I could have gotten access to the um, published resources, I'm sure, back in the 
University of North Carolina, I am very sure that I would not have been put on this particular trail had it not for my being here and talking with colleagues and um, exploring things um, with them. Um, it was just through a chance conversation with a colleague um, over coffee um, that I expressed my puzzlement over Hobbes at the Hales use of this odd term, potestas, irritans, irritating or invalidating power. And we began talking about it and talking about it, and, he, and um, I was put on Suarez and canon law, and I worked it out more and found all sorts of things. And then um, I employed um, a graduate student um, to help me translate some of the Suarez, um, the work um, of Suarez that was most directly relevant to this topic, has never been translated into English. Um, and I don't have um, adequate command over Latin to be able to read it myself, so I had um, um, this PhD student help me. Um, and there is some work on this portion of Suarez by um, a Spanish writer, and um, I read Spanish a bit, but not with altogether great confidence, so I had a, the student from Venezuela who helped me. Uh, do that. So I had resources here that I probably would not have had elsewhere. Right. Uh, it was really quite wonderful. Uh, and no doubt there will be at least one separate research paper out of that piece all by itself. Um, I, I've written it up um, and, it, and presented um, um, a version of it already to the Legal History Seminar here at Cambridge. So all those sort of things would not have happened had it not been for my here, here. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. <coughs> um, still on the subject of your research mm -hmm. topics, you said uh, in your last interview, I quote, then after I pretty much finish up the editing project on Sir Matthew Hale's work, I'll put together a book on Hale and Hobbes and perhaps bend them in some key themes, the nature of law, the nature of legal reasoning, authority mm -hmm. and sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Did you make much progress with that, Professor Postino? Um That's still um, on the agenda, but um, it's now clear to me that the work on the rule of law um, has the shape of a book, and in fact I've talked to publishers about it, and they seem to be excited about it. So I think I'm going to throw my energies first into that and then get back to the Hale Hobbs and Bentham at a later date. Um, time is only <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> finite in its amount. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> During your interview, you spoke about your 1986 book, Bentham hmm. and the Common Law Tradition, and I wonder if I can just ask you a few sort of follow-up <clears throat> questions. <clears throat> We, we talked briefly about Francesco Ferrara's observations on your <coughs> direct mm -hmm. utilitarian theory, and you said that you might bring out a second edition of the Bentham mm -hmm. to address his criticisms, and I wondered whether you'd had any further thoughts about that. Yes, well, indeed. Um, one of the reasons why I've had that decided not to turn early on to the Hobbes Hale Bentham project that we just mentioned. Um, is that I'm now very keen to um, um, bring out a second edition of uh, Bentham and the Common Law Tradition, and I've talked with a publisher already, and I will continue. Um, that seems pretty likely that we haven't nailed it down. Um, and in pursuit of that project, I um, did a considerable amount of work um, going through the most um, important criticisms that have um, been um, published over the years of um, Bentham and the Common Law Tradition. Um, and there are two or three that really um, issues that are really very important. One of them had to do with the one that you've mentioned. One of them had to do with my interpretation of Bentham's view of adjudication and um, the role of the principle of utility in a judge's um, legal reasoning. Um, I researched that a, a 
great deal. Went back to um, a number of the manuscripts and, and other published works of Bentham and um, then wrote a paper uh, which I presented um, at least in, two, in Paris and in London um, on just that topic. Um, that will be um, the, the core of the, will probably be a, um, an afterword or a postscript to the 1986 publication. Um, and there, what I do is I, um, I take seriously the criticisms of uh, Ferraro and, and others. John Dinwiddie and, um, is a major early uh, critic in this respect. Um, and what I discovered is that um, they're, um, they're calling attention to aspects of the texts um, and different and competing interpretation or reading of the text um, was valuable in rethinking for my rethinking of the um, position I came to in the essential the last chapter the second to last chapter of the book. However, um, I think both they and I made um, a serious error of a more fundamental sort about the nature of Bentham's project. Um, so the revision um, that I will propose in um, this um, second edition will be a revision of um, accepting part of what of the criticism, but saying we we um, neither are quite on track, and there's a more fundamental um, point that we have to understand about Bentham's project first. Um, which once you see that, um, one can still um, maintain what I want to maintain in the Bentham and the common law tradition that Bentham was in sort of anachronistic language a direct utilitarian all through his life and through all his work but nevertheless had at certain points in his career um, views about the institutional context in which judicial reasoning or legal reasoning or um, reasoning of ordinary citizens which it ultimately rooted in the principle of utility. Nevertheless, the institutional context in which that occurs um, changes, and so the framework for um, making utilitarian kind of deliberations also changes. The um, result is that you don't have to give up the, the interpretation of Bentham as a direct utilitarian to see that he had, in some cases, rather strict constraints on of an institutional sort, constraints on judicial reasoning. Um, I didn't see that clearly enough in the last chapter of the book. I now see it much more clearly. So I think in um, the, the um, next edition of this, there will be an attempt to both um, affirm some parts, a good, goodly part of the book, and also to say, well, there's some more yet to, to say about this whole project, and I think something even more subtle and interesting than I was able to see now, what, 25 or 30 years ago. Um, Very interesting. Well, <coughs> you mentioned last week that there has been a recent Chinese translation yes. of the book, which I thought was very interesting, with yeah. a new preface yeah. published by the Law Press of China. Right. And I wonder, why do you think there should be this interest in China in the writings of a 19th yes. century English philosopher, English philosopher about yes. the common law? Yes, um, I... It is not easy for me to see why. Um, I know there, there are a couple of um, explanations by way of um, personalities involved. It just turns out that um, there's a young man doing a PhD, I think probably completed it now, at um, University College London um, in legal theory, who, who got very closely involved in the uh, Bentham Project, and that's where UCL is, is the place where um, Bentham's manuscripts are all located, and there's a major publishing, editing and publishing project um, headquartered at University College of London. Um, this young man got involved in it, um, and he also had connections in China. I mean, he is, I'm sorry, he is Chinese. They come from Beijing University and Zhengzhou. Um, and um, a new... Um, Inst International Institute for Bentham Studies was established 
at Jungjo University. Now, so that's the the vehicle in um, through which or by which the um, the Bentham Institute was established. Um, but why there would be interest in it, and so interest in actually establishing an institute of that sort, it's not altogether clear to me. Um, Bentham is um, um, has is not a um, he's not a defender of the common law. Um, he's a um, in many ways a radical critic of the common law, the structure of the English legal system. Um, was something of a reformer. Um, with um, significantly significant liberal um, tendencies, but also with um, much more attention to kind of institutional structure. Now, it's possible that something like that attracts um, the Chinese. I don't know. There's also a very thriving um, um, culture of interest in Bentham in Japan. Um, that might be a little bit easier to explain, um, but nevertheless, they are two very different cultures that have now begun to take considerable interest in um, in the work of Bentham. Um, maybe over time, I'll be able to understand more deeply why. Um, but I welcome it, um, and um, um, there is enough interest such that the book, like mine, published some years ago now. Um, was thought significant enough. Um, had, there was enough of a, a market um, yes. for there to be a full-scale translation, and that book is 420 or 30 pages long, and um, that was a, a major endeavor on, endeavor on their part. Yeah. There has recently appeared a CUP volume, mm -hmm. Bentham's Theory of Law and Public Opinion, that's edited <coughs> by Professors Zai and Quinn, ICUP published, was supposed to be published last month, yep. uh, to which you contributed two chapters. Mm -hmm. Both are about the rule of law, one on mutual accountability, and the other on publicity. And I wondered if you could summarize briefly your overall contribution with these chapters to the theme of the book, which focused on Bentham's notions of public opinion. Yes. So um, that book collected the um, papers presented at a conference in Zhangzhou University in 2012 at the um, inauguration of this International Bentham Institute in Zhangzhou. Um, I was asked to do um, a lecture on Bentham for that. They also asked me to do a lecture, a general lecture to students and faculty, not directly associated with the inauguration of that institute. Um, the paper I wrote um, on Bentham for the Bentham part of that um, uh, event there um, was on Bentham on the idea of publicity and the really central role of the idea of publicity and um, openness of government, um, transparency of government, um, and the role of public control, or he calls it the public opinion tribunal, um, the role of public control in the um, shaping and managing and control of ruling power. Um, so it was on that issue, um, which is very close to the idea of the rule of law. Um, he calls it, not, he never uses the term rule of law, he talks about um, securities against misrule. Publicity is the single most important um, constraint on the exercise of power, he thinks. Um, now, there's, his language is very different, the, even in the conceptual framework is different from my work on fidelity and the rule of law but you can begin to see a kind of convergence between the two. So the paper I gave, um, independent of the, the um, Bentham conference, was on law's rule. Um, and it's that, it was one of the um, two papers I had um, already been working on in which this notion of the 
core sort of foundational notion of fidelity of law um, is used to explain how it is that law rules. Fidelity to law is, um, you might think, um, a, um, a notion that um, approaches Bentham's idea of the role of publicity and public opinion in the tribunal. It's at all his own particular way of framing things, um, and my, my way of framing things is different, but they, the ideas converge. Um, so those two papers, while they one was on the rule of law, one's on Bentham and publicity, they actually were on the same topic, um, coming, coming at it from two very different directions. Well, I, I was intrigued by a comment made in the introduction by Professor Frederick Rosen, mm -hmm. apropos your second chapter, where he cited the possibility of Bentham's public opinion tribunal being seen as, and I quote, an alternative system of law to that emanating from legislators. Mm. <clears throat> Yeah, he even, Bentham, even says at one point um, in his um, extensive work on what he calls the Constitutional Code, that is the, the public law, in his view of the public law as codified, um, he says um, public opinion and its, um, and the norms or rules that emerge from it, customs, you might say, um, could constitute a form of law itself, um, at least, um, at least as um, seriously to be considered as the common law itself, which is thought to be um, deeply customary in a way, but in Bentham's own view, um, not truly customary because its roots are not sufficiently broadly sunk into the community, whereas the public opinion tribunal and its norms, its customs, its um, rules uh, are more broadly rooted in the community as a whole. Um, I think that's what um, Professor Rosen had in mind. Um, it's a startling thing for someone like Bentham to say because he also holds the view that law doesn't ex Oops. law doesn't um, exist unless it is the product of someone's um, making and public opinion, uh, explicit making and explicit making in um, um, language that is itself articulated and sort of statutory and the like. Public opinion doesn't have that shape at all. So it's an it's an extraordinary thing for Bentham to say, um, and it is a one-off comment. So one doesn't want to put a lot of weight on it. Professor Costima, looking back on your year, what would you describe as the highlights? Well, I think two things. Um, and, and as far as um, my being here at Cambridge, um, the the one thing is that I think the teaching was a um, ener energizing, um, intellectually. Um, nourishing kind of activity. Um, I thoroughly enjoy the interaction with the students um, and I um, found their um, openness and their willingness to engage quite seriously in the kind of questions that I think interesting but also I think is important for them to consider. Their openness and um, was really encouraging to me. So the, the, uh, the lecturing, the teaching was um, a real high point. The other is that this this extraordinary encounter just over coffee, which sent me sent me down a whole new um, research path, um, really confirmed to me the value of um, changing one's academic surroundings from time to time, um, um, which then enables one to, to see things new and to. Um, learn from the experience and uh, capabilities and um, intelligence of other people around. So those are the two highlights, I think. Um, new directions in research. The third, I think, is probably the... Um, um, I've had the opportunity here in Cambridge and 
um, elsewhere in England and in Europe to um, bring to the public these um, emerging thoughts about the foundations of rule of law um, in a way that um, um, was both encouraging and also enabled me to think much more deeply and broadly about the topic than I had before. Um, so I have a chance from time to time to lecture elsewhere, but this was, um, um, I had an intense and many opportunities to do that, and that was really very good for my own sort of intellectual um, um, building my batteries, filling my batteries back up again. Um. You'll soon return to North Carolina, mm. and I wonder what awaits you when you return. Well, um, I'm very fortunate in that I will return to um, my own department, mainly philosophy department in the law school. <clears throat> um, but the first term back, I have um, an additional semester's research leave at which time I'll carry on the various projects we've talked about. Um, and in the spring, I will um, be back to full-time teaching. Um, and then I'll teach one course in the law school at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And one, <clears throat> I believe it is, an undergraduate political philosophy class. Um, and continue to do whatever uh, research I can squeeze in. Um, yeah. Well... That brings us to the end of the mm. second interview. Mm. All that remains is for me to thank you very much indeed for such a great contribution to our archive. We're very grateful to you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure for me too. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank mm -hmm. you so much.